Hello, everyone, and welcome to my session, Crack the Reading Code with Decodable Texts. Um, I'm so excited to be presenting at the Seesaw Connect 2024 conference. Um, I feel very honored that I had the opportunity to present last year, so you may remember me from my presentation last year on Seven Mighty Moves, and I'm just Thrilled to be back and to get to share all about decodable texts with you today. So my name is Lindsay Kemeny, and I'm the author of the book, Seven Mighty Moves. And I'm also a teacher. And yes, I'm a current teacher um, and I'm currently teaching first grade. I love teaching. I have no plans to leave the classroom. I love it. And I also love presenting um, for teachers and writing. And um, I think it's, it's just really helpful that I still am in the classroom teaching because that just helps me better explain things when I go to present to someone. Um, so what's important to know about me is yes, I am a current teacher. Also, I'm a huge literacy nerd. And really all, I'm just I'm really, really passionate about literacy for our students. I think teaching our students to read is one of the greatest gifts we can give them. Um, and that might seem a little extreme to you, but the reason I am so passionate about that is because of my son and the experiences we've had. And I really dove into his story in last year's presentation. So you might remember that. I'm not gonna go deep into it today, but the short of it is he's my third child, my first two learned to read rather easily. And so I was really pretty surprised when along comes my third um, child and he was struggling to learn to read. And I was doing all the things I had been taught in college and my early years of teaching and nothing seemed to be working. And I was really kind of embarrassed because I'm a teacher, but I couldn't help my own son learn to read. And when he was in second grade is when he was diagnosed with dyslexia, as well as dysgraphia and dyscalculia. And it just changed my world because it really forced me to take a hard look at the way I was teaching reading and just to take a deep dive into effective literacy instruction. And that's when I found out that a lot of the things I had been taught um, in college, in my early years of teaching, were not aligned with the research. And not only were they not aligned, some of the things that I had been taught had literally been debunked by research and there wasn't research to support them. So I was really, really upset um, at the things I had, you know, the things I didn't know. Um, and in addition, my son was diagnosed with depression at this time and his depression all centered around his struggles learning to read and it's just those uh experiences through his depression just completely changed me and i saw firsthand how tightly connected self-esteem and reading are and um we did all these things to help his depression but i saw that what helped him the most was the ability to read. And I wish I had time more to go to explain that and go more um, into that story. If you've heard me speak before, you've probably heard me share that. Um, but it's just, um, I just really saw just the huge impact um, the ability to read has on our lives. And it just opens up the windows of opportunity for students. So whatever your role is, whether you are a teacher right there on the front lines, or if you're more in a supportive role, like a literacy coach or a um, administration, um, we all play a part in this important thing where we are teaching literacy um, in the classroom and to our students. And so all our roles are so important and vital, and it's just one of the greatest things we can do. So what I found is that as I was working with my son, I was making changes when I was working with him, and then I was making those changes in the classroom. And I found that those changes that I was making, I can group into these seven categories or these seven um 
yeah, these, these seven categories, these seven moves I was making. And those represent the seven mighty moves. And so that is what my book centers around. And if you were in my session last year, then you know we did just quickly, I talked about each move. I shared the research behind each move. And then I shared some just practical things you can do right away. Um, I am a teacher. And so when I go to professional development trainings, I like the how I'm like, give me the ideas, <laughs> give me suggestions for what I can do right away. And so when I'm providing professional development, I try to do the same thing. So today, what we're going to be doing is just narrowing in on those moves three and four. Um, I also want to say that I would love to give away a copy of my book to seven mighty moves so we're going to choose a winner um that is participating um that is attending our um uh this presentation and um we will reach out to the winner it will be either seesaw or me will we'll just choose someone by random and we will send you an email um to get your address and then i will mail you out a copy of seven mighty moves okay so our goals, we're going to talk about what decodable texts are, why they are important, and then most importantly, how we can best use them in our classrooms. Um, additionally, how we can prompt students when they come to a word that they don't know. So um, this was really one of uh, the biggest moves I made, um, at, especially at the beginning. And this is also this is when I also started to get a little uneasy with some of the things I had been taught even before my son was diagnosed with dyslexia because the same year my son was diagnosed was also the my first year teaching kindergarten. And I had taught second grade up until this point and then I got moved to kindergarten. And automatically in kindergarten, you spend all this time teaching the letter names and sounds. And I was so excited to show my students, okay, I'm going to bring you back to my small group table. And now I'm going to show you how you can read. You can take those letter sounds that you know now, and you're going to be able to blend them into words and read. But the books that I had that were provided to me through the big box curriculum were those predictable repetitive texts. So it's things like, we cleaned up the garage, we cleaned up the kitchen, we cleaned up the bedroom. And these books um, were, were filled with sound spelling correspondences that I had not taught. Like think of the word cleaned. Well, E-A, I haven't taught that to my kindergartners. E-D, I haven't taught that to my kindergartners. But those kind of advanced concepts were in these books. And so I felt like I had to tell my students to throw everything I had been teaching them out the window because I found myself saying, oh, wait, oh, no, you, you can't sound this one out. Look at the picture. Does it give you a clue? And I was like, ah, like, OK, I had used I had said those kinds of things all the time when I was teaching second grade and I didn't think anything of it. In fact, it had been drilled into me that this is what you do and this is how you teach kids. Um, but it was when I was teaching kindergarten that suddenly I started to get uneasy that I had been taught that because I was like, oh, I, I feel like I'm giving them the wrong idea of what reading is. Um, and yes, that is what I was doing and that's what I had been taught, okay? But so let's think about a decodable and if you look at this illustration, let's say that um, I had taught you these four sound symbol correspondences. Okay, we have a, ah, we have the triangle is m, mm, we have that circle filled in circle is s, and the dot is t. All right, so let's say I had just taught you those four symbols. Now, um, can you? sound that out and see what this says right here and go ahead and put it in the chat. Sam sat. Yes, you got it. That says Sam sat. You could do that. Now that might have been a little bit challenging at first, but you could see how once you got automatic with those symbols and had practiced them, that would become easier. Now let's say I had still just taught you those same four symbols. But then I give you a book that looks like this. What does that say? Put it in the chat. <laughs> I mean, it's 
seems ridiculous when you think about it, but we do this. So this says, I saw Sam at the store. He was buying candy. And the idea is um, it would be repetitive. I saw Sam at the store. He was buying milk. I saw Sam at the store. He was buying cheese. I saw Sam at the store. He was buying, you know, whatever. And so the student would just have to memorize the pattern and look at the picture to figure out the word. Okay. But the first problem with these predictable repetitive texts is, one, they're not getting any practice with the phonics skills I've taught them right? They're not getting any practice with that. Like, I just taught you the CH digraph spells ch, but then I, so I want you to practice that, and I want you to see a book that has a lot of words with CH, ch, but this, these kind of books aren't giving you the practice. Additionally, the only way for the students to read those books, and in fact, they're written for this purpose, is for students to memorize the pattern, look at the picture, and guess from the context. Okay, and those things are part of something we call the three queuing system or the three queuing strategies. And I was heavily trained in this. Um, and it's this idea that readers use various cues to figure out the words as they are reading. The problem is there is no research to support these strategies. And okay, don't throw tomatoes at me because I know that is hard to hear. And I did this for years. So know that. And when I found this out, I was so upset. I was so upset. I had been taught these things and I did these things for years when this is something that has been debunked by research because this is not what good readers do. This is what poor readers do. Um, and you might not be familiar with three queuing, but you might be familiar with the Beanie Baby strategies. These are based on three queuing. So this is like, use your eagle eye. Look at the picture. Does it give you a clue? Be like Skippy the Frog. Skip over the word. Read the rest of the sentence and then figure out the word. Or um, get your mouth ready like lips the fish and no one even knows how that is helpful. <laughs> it's just not. Okay, so um, the three queuing system is not supported by research. And it's it what the research does say is that those are strategies poor readers use, not good readers. So good readers can read words in isolation. They don't need a picture to decode the word. They don't need the context to guess what the word is. They can read a word in isolation, and we know that from research. Um, so when we are teaching our students these strategies, we are literally teaching them to read like a poor reader. Um, and I saw this with my son because this is what he would do. Guess, 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 guess. As soon as he came to a word he didn't know or a word that was a little bit bigger, his eyes went off that word so fast and he would um, look at the picture. He would try to guess. He'd look at the first letter and guess um, until he had the skills he needed. Once he had the skills, then he didn't need to guess. Um, and once he could break the habit because it becomes a really bad habit. And even if you're not teaching even if you don't teach the three queuing strategies, students will start to do that. Um, like they might panic, they just guess, and they and, and if they're given these books that are way too hard for them at the beginning, then they'll start developing this habit. Um, so I want to be very clear about something. Okay. So when I I go back here and remember I was saying like this, like we don't want them to be using the context to decode the word, or we don't want to use the pictures to decode the word. I'm not saying that you never use context. Okay. Because we do use context. We need context to understand the meaning of the word or the meaning of what's happening in the story. You use context to understand, is it wind or wind? Is this word read or read? The context is going to help us with that. But what I'm saying is that for th that we don't use the context to figure out or decode that word. We don't want it to guess that word. And the same with pictures. We're not saying, oh, we never use pictures. No, or don't look at the pictures. No, the pictures add to the comprehension. They help us understand what's happening. They're engaging. And I love vibrant, beautiful pictures, okay? But we don't want them to rely on the picture to figure out what the word is. So what do we want instead? 
we want students to become familiar with the details of the words. And what they need to do is they need to match the sounds they hear with the letters they see with the meaning of the word. Those three things, that's what needs to happen for that word to be stored in their memory so that they can retrieve this effortlessly and automatically in the future. So what's happening if they're using these cueing strategies instead? Their eyes go off the word, right? They, they go off. They don't even look. They'll look at the first letter and everything else is a blur and they're just going to guess. But if they're doing that, then they're not, they're not, um, they're not decoding that word all the way through. They're not getting familiar with the details of the word and they can't store that in long-term memory. Um, so we want to facilitate that. And it's these three things matching the sounds they hear with the letters they see with the meaning of the word. These three things have to happen for that word to be orthographically mapped. If you've heard that, that is a, a process we're talking about in the brain, and that's kind of the goal. So we don't want our students to skip that very necessary step of decoding at first. And let me tell you, it is a lot easier to listen to a kindergarten student read a predictable repetitive text than a decodable one. <laughs> because when they read those predictable repetitive texts, and I should say, quote unquote, read, I mean, they sound fluent already versus when they read a decodable you hear them sound out sat sat and then on the next page it's the exact same word sat and they're slowly decoding and you have to be so patient but it's a necessary struggle that has to happen we can't skip that step it's a critical step um i like this quote talking about the words that appear in beginning reading texts may well exert a more powerful influence in shaping children's word identification strategies than the method of reading instruction wow but you can see that if you spend all this time teaching letter names and sounds in your phonics lesson and then you go and have to have them practice you give them a predictable repetitive text i mean those two don't align. I want them to practice and solidify the skills I was teaching them. I don't want them to pick up bad habits, okay? And then and then I also don't want them just to memorize words as a whole. I want them to break down the words. I want them to match the sounds with the letters, with the meaning. If you look at this study, really interesting because they found that beginning readers who focus on the letter-sound relationships instead of memorizing whole words, they increase activity in the area of the brain best wire for reading. That's what I want. I want to increase activity in that area. I want to prep my students to be good readers. Um, another reason why is because phonics teaching is more effective when children are given immediate opportunities to apply what they have learned to their reading. And that's what decodables can do. They can help us apply what we just taught in phonics in connected text. And I love this quote by Dr. Pam Kastner. She says that if it's been taught but not mastered, there's probably a practice gap. And when I heard that her say that, I just thought, oh, yes, that is the problem. There's probably a practice gap. We And I'm always thinking about how can I up the opportunities for practice? How many minutes of practice are my students getting? Um, I want them to practice reading. And, and how can I facilitate that in my classroom? It's a really common mistake that we make is not to give enough opportunities for practice. And so that's another reason why I love decodables. So a decodable, um, in, uh, a, a decodable book, okay, on the other hand, versus, you know, different than those predi predictable repetitive texts, decodables can be sounded out based on the phonics skill taught. They usually focus on one target phonics skill. Not always, because sometimes there's a review of several skills. And I like that. And especially if you're a kindergarten teacher, you know you want to have lots and lots of books at just the CBC level, right? Um, and just to review and get those skills automatic. You want them to follow a scope and sequence. Now that might be like, well, of course I do. But um, that is something like that first year I told you when I was teaching kindergarten and I just thought, oh my gosh, I don't like these predictable repetitive texts. 
I'm going to get um, some decodables. And so I went to TVT and bought some. And there was no scope and sequence. So it just like made sense. It was just what, I mean, it didn't make sense. It was just whatever the author thought, you know, was decodable and she would put in the books. Um, and, and that just doesn't make sense because you're like, well, I don't want to teach um, uh, like words with SH. I don't want those in my decodable until I've taught SH. And so you kind of have to look at a scope and sequence and make sure consider how it aligns to yours okay um other things is they they the decodable text must be a good match for the reader so think of that decodability on a continuum all right because what's decodable for one student might not be decodable for another so like you might have a decodable that has sh and it's very decodable but if the student if it's the beginning of the year kindergarten and you haven't taught the sh um, then that's not decodable for that student so think of it as a continuum so let's look at a few decodables all these pictures in here are from decodables that i use and love in my classroom and so here are some can you tell what and just put it in the chat um what skills the students need to read this and what is the target skill of, of, of this book? Okay, so as you're looking at this, it, it, it basically seems like your basic letter sounds, right? They need to know those basic letter sounds. And the skill focus is short A. You can see that almost every word has the short A. Um, there's a high frequency word that's going to be a little bit more tricky that is not decodable. You see what word that is? Yes, that's the word the. All right. And so um, you're going to have some irregular words in, in the books. That's just going to happen. That has to happen, really, because otherwise the book is going to sound really odd. <laughs> um, but the trick is you just don't want one that has too many, especially at the beginning. Like my brand new fragile readers, I really want um, those high frequency words limited um, until, I, I mean, I, my main thing is to have them practice those sound symbol correspondences and then we have some words. As students are getting a little bit more proficient, I'm okay with more high frequency words in there, but I still want the majority of the words to be decodable words. Okay, here's another book. Um, can you tell what the skill focus is here? And also be looking for any words that are maybe irregular, or going to be a little bit harder. Go ahead and put them in the chat. So yes, the, the uh, focus here is CH. You can see we have a lot of words with CH. Chimp, champ, branch, munch. Um, and we have some words that have those blends or consonant clusters. Now, you don't necessarily have to have taught them um, the consonant cluster, right? Because it's just like, mm, those are just two sounds they know. But you just know that this book, for some, they might need some support with blending because it is a little harder to blend um, words that have more phonemes or more sounds in them. Um, do you see any of those irregular or those high frequency words that might be a little tricky? Um, we have is and we have as and we have a or a. Now is and as, I do teach my students that s spells the z sound as well as the s. So that might not be tricky for your students if you've taught that. If you haven't taught that, that's something that you're going to want to bring up here. Okay, here's another one. And can't you see all these books I choose? Like, I love the illustrations. I love to have these beautiful pictures and engaging storylines when I have decodables. And so if you've been turned off by decodables in the past, just um, look for others because the market is just being flooded with these beautiful decodables. And it's so exciting. Okay, what's a skill focus here? We have ing, I-N-G, ing. Yes. Um, anything else that's going to be tricky? We have some high frequency words. We have by and to. Um, those might be tricky. We have he and me. That, that might not be tricky if you've taught that open syllable. The vowel is long with the open syllables. If you taught that, those are decodable. If you haven't taught that, that's something you're going to want to um, pull out. Um, and same again with the his. We have the s representing the z sound. 
Okay, and here's another. You can see we're getting a little harder um, here because we're getting a little further along in a phonic scope and sequence. So we, we have some more, um, it's getting a little more challenging. You see what the focus is here? That vowel consonant E, or I like to call it magic E. We have a lot of A consonant E words here that have that long vowel. What words are going to be tricky in here? We've got um, we've got need with the two E's. Uh, most likely, most scope and sequences don't teach that vowel team before vowel consonant E. So the, it's probably one you haven't taught that you're going to want to um, preview for students. We've got the word said. We've got the word saw. Um, and two, those might be a little tricky. And this one is a little further along. This is a little bit harder one. Um, we Can you tell what the focus is here? This is soft C and soft G. So you have the ridge where the DGE is spelling J after the short vowel. We have gem where there's an E after the G that spells J. And you can see faces, that soft C. When the E is after that C, it's the soft C. Okay, so we're getting a little bit harder, but wonderful because we want to progressively get harder with our decodables. All right, so what I'm going to share is um, a quick, my, my small group decodable text routine. And I break this up by thinking about what we do before we read the text, during the text, and after reading. Now, my focus in small group is this, the during reading part, having students read. That's what I want them to um, th that's where I spend the bulk of my time because again, we don't want phonics in isolation. We want plenty of opportunities for practice. So if I'm short on time in my small group, then I just keep that before reading pretty quick and uh, spend the bulk of the time on that, having them read where I'm right there and can give feedback. Um, and then after reading, we can um, ask some questions, but I might keep that quick too, because my, the bulk of the time I want to spend decoding having the students decode. So I'm going to quickly go through this routine and hopefully you will get some ideas that would help you in your classroom. So first I'm going to review that target skill. So in this example, it's going to be CH diagraph, okay? And we're going to read and write words that contain that target sk skill. Take the book that you're using and take the words right out of that book because it's going to be a great um, preview for them. Um, and just helping prep them to read it. So, um, and I might not have time to do both reading and writing. It depends on how much time I have in my small group. So I might just have, um, I might just do one or the other. So I have a little tabletop easel and I can write the words up there and we can read them together. Um, we can also write them. So you can see the student is writing on the little small, I have these small mini whiteboards that I use in small group. And I'm sorry, everyone always asks me where I got them. And I got them like 20 years ago and they were just samples from a whiteboard company. Like they didn't even sell them. They're just samples so you could see what their whiteboards were like. So I'm sorry, um, I haven't found any um, that you could just purchase right now, unfortunately. But I just love them at small group because they don't take up a lot of space. Okay, so then we might write some. So you can see like this, my student is writing the word chomp and they're gonna see the word chomp in the book we're going to read. So it's awesome, it's right there, okay? Or, or I might use these little word lists and I make these word lists in my phonics lesson. So if I just did a phonics lesson on CH, then um, in my I have them in pairs and in our whole group phonics lesson, they're gonna practice reading and it only takes like one or two minutes, they're gonna read some words. And then I'm just gonna reuse those in my small group um, to get extra practice. The other thing you want to do before reading is to preview or review any of those irregular high frequency words. I would also add in here if there's any vocabulary word that your student is going to need, um, then you, you could do that right here too. Okay, so depending how much time you have, if you listened to me speak last week or last year, or if you have my book, you know that I have a whole routine for irregular high frequency words. If I have time and it's a brand new word, I could go through the whole routine. If not, then I'm just gonna make it quick. And I'm gonna say like, this is the word they. Look, the E-Y is spelling the sound 
A, what sound? A, yes. Okay, so let's blend and say this word. V, A, they, yep. Okay, and we're also going to have this word. The word is do. So what sound do you think the O is spelling in this sound, in this word? Ooh, yes, the O is spelling ooh. So this is what word? Do. Okay, so I might just do a quick um, one or if I have more time, I'm going to do the whole um, routine. It's uh, in move five of my, uh, of Seven Mighty Moves, my book. All right, and so that's all the stuff for pre-reading. Now, during reading. And during reading, I, the way I like my students to read is I stack or start them. And this is just so that we have more time. Like I'm always thinking, how many minutes of practice are they getting? How many minutes of practice reading aloud where I'm right here with my, with my support? And so what I do is I have everybody reading aloud um, at the same time, but in different spots in the book. And it sounds chaotic, but it's really not. So if I have five students at my table, I give books to students in spots one, three, and five. And then students in spots two and four, I'm going to give those word lists, okay? So the students with books are going to go ahead and start reading aloud, and those students in spots two and four are reading aloud from the word list. And then once the students in spots one, three, and five flip and, and go to the next page, I can give books to the students in spots two and four, and they can start reading. So I'm just doing that so that they're all reading at their own place, and they're not just listening to their neighbor. Okay, so here's just a little video clip. You can see I have some students. Um, here's when I was teaching kindergarten. Here's some of my kindergartners, where you can just see they're all just reading in their own spot. Okay, and here is when I was teaching second grade. I do the same thing with second grade, but they're just reading harder books. Okay, so you get the idea. So they're our, at their own place reading aloud. And then what I'm doing is I'm listening in and helping and supporting um, and giving feedback. And you find that you get really good at listening to one student, listening into this one, and then I might hear something over here. And I go, oh, check that again. And then, um, and then I can listen back. So you'll get really good at kind of managing all students. Okay, and just a few tips for as you're working with students. One thing I'm doing is always making sure their eyes are on the words. Because remember, I need them to be familiar with the details of the words. And so one of the first habits I teach my first graders is to use their finger to track. Um, because I want them to keep their eyes on the word because I really want them to match the sounds they hear with the letters they see with the meaning of the word. Those three things have to happen in order for them to orthographically map that word, which is a big word, but just think that's just going to make it so that they're storing that in their memory, okay? Um, and, uh, and some students, it's going to take a lot more practice than others for that process to occur. All right, and then I like to do something called during reading called, re, I call it read, model, read again. So I'll have the student read like a part of the text, like maybe the page or paragraph or sentence. They read it first. Then I say, great, now listen to me as I read it. And I model and go back and read that same part of the text. And then I have them go back and read it a second time. Now, I love this because first of all, it gives them... Um, they have that productive struggle that they need at the beginning. I like them doing that good, um, you know, working through those words the first time. And then I can go back and model appropriate phrasing and rate and the expression. And then they get to get a second pass, which is great because they're getting more practice. They're going to, and then it's good for their confidence because they're going to read it better the, the second time. So listen to the student as we do this. Um, and you'll hear hear that when she reads it the second time, she kind of mimics the way I read it. But it is had Say R. hard from him to for him to read. It is hard for him to 
right. Good listen to me. But it is hard for him to read. It is hard for him to write. But it is hard for him to read. It is hard for him to write. So you could hear that, how she kind of mimicked how I said it, which is really kind of fun. Okay. Um, and then I love Dr. Mark Seidenberg said the best cue to a word is the word itself. So I don't need all these other things. I don't need their eyes going off of the page to look at one of those beanie baby strategies to know what to do. I need them to keep their eyes on the word and they just need that word and they need to learn to trust the letters and to trust the phonics. Um, knowledge that they have, the skills that I have taught them. And that's another reason why I like those decodables, because it teaches them to trust that information. Um, and it just further prepares them for then when they're going to get to harder um, words later on. So what I do um, is the instead of the three cueing strategies, this is what I do when a student comes to a word they don't know. First, these three prompts. First is the pointing prompt. Um, and I like to use a pencil because I can point to not even just the word they missed, but sometimes the part of the word they missed. Usually the vowel sound, right? Those usually um, are the ones that can be tricky. So I'm going to point to those sounds and I'm just going to wait because sometimes they're going to go ahead and self-correct and they'll be able to say it right. Um, uh, if they don't know the sound, um, then I go to the verbal prompt here in green. So if they can't recall the sound, I'm going to tell them the sound. So I mean, it might be that they don't remember it or just that it's a this is a harder word and they don't ha they haven't been taught that sound. So if it's the word house, I could point to the OU and I say, these letters spell ow. What sound? And then the, the student can say ow. And then I go to the blending prompt and I say, okay, now I have them blend. Okay, say the sounds, house, house. So they're going to blend. So I'm, making, I'm having them do the work. If I just tell them the whole word, then I'm doing the work. I want them to do the work. Again, what do I want? I want them to match the sounds they hear with the letters they see with the meaning of the word. And if I just tell them the word, that's not happening and they're, they might not be making that connection. So I just tell them the sound they need and then they're going to blend and um, say the word. Um, so I was going to share this little video. I'm going to skip it just because we're running short on time. Um, and then after reading, um, I'm going to ask them questions about the text. I love when the text have the questions for me because I'm not good at coming up with questions on the spot. And a lot of it is because I'm paying it so much attention to the students, like what they're missing, how to help them, how to scaffold, how to help them blend if they're struggling to blend, that I'm not always thinking about the story. And so I love when the, the questions are there for me. Or I can just have them retell the story. Um, now, we know this is not the time. This is like the main goal of decodables is not, you know, I'm not going to have these deep, rich conversations necessarily about the decodable. Those are going to be at another time when I'm doing my rich read alouds or I'm scaffolding them into complex text and we're having our rich discussions around there. Um, but with the decodables, I still want to attend to the meaning. So even though our focus is on the decoding and the automaticity, I always want to make sure they're paying attention to the the meaning of the word or the meaning of the story like what's happening so um, by doing this this is going to help that all right if you have my book i have um a little um you know, a pdf a qr code and you can download this small group decodable text routine and then it's important to know that decodable texts are like training wheels. Kids need them for only a short amount of time, and the goal is to transition away from them as a child is ready. So I get really worried sometimes with this, you know, what we call the science of reading. We're making changes that sometimes we overcorrect. And so be careful not to overcorrect because the science of reading doesn't mean now we only read decodables, okay? No, you need them for a short amount of time and then you transition students away from them. Um, the tricky thing is not all students are ready at the same time to transition away from them. I have found that most, most students, in my opinion, are ready the middle of first grade, some not until the end of first grade, 
that doesn't mean there's they still wouldn't um it wouldn't be you know uh helpful for them to read decodables because let's say you're a second grade teacher and you're teaching some harder concepts or let's say you're teaching IGHI and you want them to master that well how wonderful to have a decodable passage where they're going to see a whole bunch of words with IGH so there still might be use for them however you're also scaffolding them into complex text so if you came to my first grade classroom um in you know February we're reading all click clack moo cows that type and they're reading it in pairs and partners and um, we read frog and toad um so it's a big part is yes they're reading these decodables and getting this practice and as they're ready you transition them into complex text or into regular text um, if you trans, if you give them a regular text and they resort to a lot of guessing, then you're like, oh, okay, I need a backup and we need more practice at deco uh, with decodables. So think about in order to help them transition away from decodables, think about the percentage of decodable words. So I will start my first graders off in very highly decodable books where the percentage is high, like these two examples are that there's a lot of words, almost all the words in there are decodable. I mean, except for the and uh. Um, and I'll transition them from those to decodables that are less decodable. Um, so if you see this one, and then if I'm looking at this, um, look on the right side. We have the word Nana. We have said. We have whip with the WH that that might, the student might not know that. We have beans, for, you, love. Those are all some difficult words. Um, and at the beginning of the year, first grade, most of my first graders would struggle with this. But after a few months of first grade, this would be wonderful and this would be a nice way to go okay can you try something a little harder and they can read these for a little bit and then i can put them into regular text so think about that think about um scaffolding these are um another series that i really like to help scaffold students um because they they will have decodables but they're like a review of several different decodable skills and so it makes it just a little bit harder and so i love having students get into these um uh, to help with that scaffolding all right. And then with your um, with my small groups, I've got different purposes in for different groups. So some groups, you know, if I was um, when I was teaching kindergarten, I had groups that were focused on that alphabet knowledge. They didn't know their whole alphabet. So a lot of the time in small group, we are spent practicing the letter sounds. Um, and then I might have some very, very beginning decodables that are much more controlled, like the this book will only have M-A-S-P-T, right? And 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 um, those sounds in the words. And so they're getting just very beginner, um, more controlled decodables. And then I have groups where we are working on those decodables, those decoding skills, and those are all, those groups are all decodables, you know, hopefully following my sc phonic scope and sequence. I have groups that are doing great with their decoding and our focus more is on fluency. Those students might be the ones that I'm transitioning into harder decodables and then into regular texts. And the building vocabulary and content knowledge, they might not need the decodables and we are just working on some harder text for them and our focus for them is, is just that building knowledge and a little bit of probably fluency and expression too. Okay, so um, I use my data to to from my um, our screener, we use Acadians, I use that to make my groups at first, and then I'm watching my students and making adjustments and all that informal observation to see where they need help and when I need to move them. Okay, um, so things to look for in a decodable in a decodable book series, you really want to consider how it aligns to your phonics program and 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 see that it um, aligns okay. Or that if you're like, oh, this book has a lot, you know, we've we just learned e e, um, but this book has a whole bunch of o i and o y words, and I haven't taught that yet. Then you might not want to use that book until later in your sequence. Um, 
and then make sure they have plenty of words that follow that target skill, that there's a limited number of irregular words, um, the language and storyline makes sense. Um, sometimes the very, very beginner ones are a little odd sounding just because they don't have very many sounds yet. And so the, the writers are trying to only use the sounds they've been taught. Uh, but then hopefully it gets, uh, uh, but there's some that are terrible and I admit they're just terrible. And so if you have a series that you're like, Oh my gosh, this makes no sense. There's no storyline. Look for other ones. Here are some of the decodables that I love and I use. I've used a lot of, um, uh, written a lot of donors choose projects. And if you do it as a special request, then you can um, get one from any website. And so I'll do that a lot to get my um, decodables. The half pint kids are here are wonderful for kindergarten. Um, I find that they're a little too short for first grade. For my first graders, I want books that are a little bit longer. But the half pint, I loved them when I taught kindergarten. Um, whole phonics are so fun, really kind of comic book feel, really cute illustrations, and really fun stories. Like each book has this nice story arc. Flyleaf publishing is great, and they go up to harder levels, which is really great. Um, I love the Express Readers. The Dandelion Launchers um, are fun. On the bottom, I have the Laugh-A-Lot Phonics from Scholastic. I really like these. Um, you just need to know that, that they're green, that blends and digraph set. That is the hardest set. That one includes long vowels. So it includes like vowel teams. And so a lot of times people think blends and digraphs, <clears throat> a lot of phonics scope and sequences, blends and digraphs comes before vowel teams. So like if you're a kindergarten teacher, you're not gonna wanna get their blends and digraphs set. Um, but if you're a first grade teacher, like I love the blends and digraphs set at the end of the year because um, it's just reviewing all those vowel teams that we've learned. And so it's perfect for the end of the year first grade. Um, I like the nonfiction phonics readers. So great to have some nonfiction options. Just Right Readers are amazing. There's so many of them. There's like three books for each concept. And you can see they have those QR codes. So if you like to send books home, they can scan the QR code and it goes to a phonics lesson in English and in Spanish. So that's really neat. And then the geodes, those are harder. They are less decodable and they're great for helping students with the transitioning into regular text. Okay. Um, I, I do a take home book system. So I'll send home decodables on Monday and my students read them throughout the week and then they return them on Friday and we switch out the books. Um, and then I want to just share before I close, and I'm sorry, I know I'm talking so much, but we are almost out of time and I'm, I'm talking really fast, but this is going to be recorded. So you can go back um, to review it. Um, but I wanted to share a couple ideas with decodables and Seesaw. Of course, just very easily, uh, you know, one of the easiest things is just to have students take a picture of the decodable text and then read it. Dear mom and dad, Gus is a dog. Gus, the dog is fun. Gus, the dog can dig. Gus can dig. Okay, so um, that was just one of my students. Um, uh, back in the beginning of the year, first grade. And I don't know if you heard at the beginning, she goes, dear mom and dad, and then she reads it. But it's so fun because she knows her audience. And that's what's so great about Seesaw is it gives students this authentic audience, right? So she had a reason to, um, to read and she wanted to show them, hey, we read this in class today and now this is my free time and I want to do this recording for you. Um, another thing is, um, so Flyleaf Publishing, I showed you theirs. They have great decodables. They have an online portal. And so far right now, it's just free. And you can go online and um, they have these the books online. So what you can do is you can add those into Seesaw. So here's a little screencast, a video I did showing you how to do that. Okay, so you're going to go to the online portal for Flyleaf Publishing. Go down and click Students and that will pull up all the online decodables that they have. So you can scroll to and find the one that you need. Let's say we'll do this one, stink bug. 
and click on it. And that's going to pull it up. Um, you can see they can flip through and read this text. So what we're going to do is go up and copy the um, web address here and then go into Seesaw and you're going to add a new activity and do add to student journal and click drawing. And then once you're in drawing, come down here to these three dots and we're going to click link. And then we're going to paste that link that we just copied from Flyleaf right there. Click the green check. All right, and there it is right there. And we can click the green check to save it. Um, then you can choose which students you're going to assign that to. So that's great differentiation right there. Let's just say the sample student. Yeah, we'll click the green check again. And then when that student comes in um, and they see that, they're going to click on it and it's going to open up to the Flyleaf website now. And now they can um, read and practice that text. Okay, so I hope that's helpful and gives you some ideas about using decodables with Seesaw. And then, of course, we were just talking about some ideas for just using decodables. So I hope that in this session you um, got some new ideas and learned some things. Um, I would love to have you... Um, follow me on social media um, or reach out to me if you have any questions. So I am on Twitter and Instagram, just at Lindsay Kemeny. Um, and on Facebook, I have a page. It's Teaching with Lindsay Kemeny. And then I'm also um, the co-host of a podcast called Literacy Talks, um, sponsored by Reading Horizons. And I mean, if you're just a huge literacy nerd by me, like me, um, be sure to check that out. It's just fun. We talk all things literacy. And um, of course, um, I'm so excited that we're going to have a winner for my book, Seven Mighty Moves, and we will reach out to the winner. Um, and thank you guys so much. Thank you for joining me and listening to me today and just for um, going the extra mile and spending some of the time this summer um, learning and growing at this Seesaw Connect conference. I just love, um, I just love teachers who love to learn. So um, thank you so much. And um, we'll hope to... Um, See you guys um, and best wishes um, in uh, as you start your new school year here pretty soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.